The internet is made up of a number of very important public utilities, uh, which are effectively large-scale distributed systems uh, that are organized by protocols. Uh, these protocols can be uh, are often created by a small group of people that notice a problem. Uh, they design a system. They talk about it. They build prototypes. They test them. They improve them. And eventually, these protocols get uh, uh, turned into specs submitted to the IETF, uh, and they become part of the large uh, network of, of systems um, that all uh, or work together uh, to give us the um, the functionalities that we the, the that we use every day through our computers. Uh, so over time, we have a a large compendium, or accumulating compendium of protocols uh, that make up all of the interactions that, that we have online. So right now, as we speak in this moment, uh, there are probably hundreds of protocols in use uh, at the same time by, by all our machines. Uh, so the story of, of time is, is, is interesting. Uh, in you know, around 35 years ago, the internet needed a way to tell time. There were a lot of different computers um, uh, around, the, around the network um, that had a very large clock skew. And so people needed the ability to synchronize the clocks of all of these computers. And so people decided to build an internet protocol to do this. Uh, they built a distributed system to synchronize distributed clocks and provide a publicly available network-wide clock, uh, trying to reduce the skew, trying to provide access to much better clocks, and so on. Uh, NTP, uh, the system they built, uh, the network time protocol, uh, grew and grew, uh, and now nowadays powers uh, all of the all of the time and all of, all of the clocks that. Uh, that are synchronized over the internet, including our computers, um, get our time from from these uh, from this protocol and these systems. Uh, NTP nowadays uh, uh, is hooked up to to atomic clocks uh, that measure the time extremely precisely uh, and can uh, give us a, an extremely good good uh, um, notion of time. Uh, but this system was built over time uh, by uh, having a kind of a, a core set of set of parties that would. Uh, have access to kind of a, a effectively trusted sense of sense of time, and they they would uh, um, and there was a protocol designed to to be able to ask those parties for what time they uh, uh, their clock read, uh, and then a larger network of of um, sort of relayers, uh, which are these different strata, uh, uh, enabled that clock to kind of spread out across the internet. You don't want to enable uh, all parties to to uh, uh, request time from from a few nodes. Uh, and so this relaying uh, architecture served to, to distribute and disseminate uh, that information. So today, the internet uh, need, needs a way to get randomness. So the story is very similar. We need a, a foundational internet protocol, like NTP, to create a verifiable, unpredictable, and unbiased randomness source. And this uh, randomness source should be pu publicly available anywhere in the world. And so it's, it's a very similar problem to NTP, where you want uh, a set of parties uh, working together to produce uh, randomness. Uh, and then you want to distribute that randomness as far and wide as possible uh, and enable all parties in, in the network to access it. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, we'll hear a lot more about uh, how DRUN works later on, but that's effectively the, a similar structure here where there are um, a set of DRUN nodes and there are some DRUN relays that can spread out the, uh, the information across, across the network and eventually clients uh, use the time from that, uh, from that, uh, that comes from the source uh, DRUN nodes uh, in their applications. And so DRUN is designed to be you know, this very con concrete and, and concise protocol to just do that. Um, and therefore, it can become a foundational internet protocol for randomness. Uh, so the, the hope here, and, and one of the, the big reasons that um, we at Protocol Labs uh, and, and in the Python project uh, saw an enormous amount of potential in DRUN uh, is that it's, it's designed to uh, enable us to build a large public utility like uh, NTP, like DNS, like all of the other protocols that we that we use day to day, um, and provide a, a, a randomness service everywhere uh, in the world and work together to to achieve that that service. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, and so these these kinds of protocols tend to, you know, the, the open innovation of the Internet, the ability for for people to come together, find a problem, uh, design a system to solve that problem, uh, create a protocol, implement that protocol, um, and uh, get it uh, built into a, a, a 
uh, foundational uh, system and then kind of propose to the rest of the world to, to use that system, uh, that, that kind of permissionless innovation is fundamental to, to how, the, uh, how the internet has, has become so successful. It is one of the great triumphs of, of, of the internet as a, as a large uh, uh, project for, for all of humanity. The, the ability to upgrade the network, upgrade the systems that we use uh, permissionlessly as a, you know, a group coming together, building something, testing it out, making sure it works, um, and once it it uh, it gets better and better for for all kinds of use cases, then it can become then it sort of gets promoted into into this kind of public utility that uh, everybody in the in the world can rely on. Uh, so that's our hope for DRAN. We think we think that uh, that it is time that the network gets a a proper secure uh, randomness protocol that's uh, distributed everywhere. Uh, and we think that DRAN can, is is a great uh, uh, has a great shot to become become that protocol. Uh, of, of course, we'll, randomness weekends over time will change. We'll find better ways of, of doing things. Uh, and perhaps the year end, uh, over time, we'll, we'll adapt to, to incorporate those things. Uh, who knows? Uh, this is just the, the beginning for, for the long term of the year end. Uh, you know, these protocols, things like MPP and so on, uh, you know, are, are decades old and, uh, and they've gone through all kinds of upgrades. Now, I think that blockchains have a unique uh, opportunity to, to serve as, as the um, systems that uh, cause this, this network wide. Uh, randomness source to appear, uh, because many other applications can can deal with private randomness or or some kind of public randomness that's uh, very use case specific or something like that. But blockchains uh, are decentralized networks that require a lot of parties to come together to to um, uh, to produce uh, a to to again form a form some kind of system that provides a service. Uh, and randomness is critical for all kinds of uh, of, of things in blockchains. There are things uh, it's critical for consensus in in elections. And sortation based protocols, uh, things like proof of stake and and so on. Uh, it's also needed for all kinds of uh, proof protocols uh, and you know actual crypto, uh, cryptographic uh, protocols that that need to run as part of uh, various blockchains or or applications in a blockchain. Uh, and it can also it's also pretty important for uh, to get randomness into uh, things like smart contracts and so on, where uh, you can have uh, all kinds of applications that that need access to a a, um, a trusted uh, uh, or not just, but they need access to it to a an unbiasable and verifiable uh, source of source of randomness. Um, actual elections, or beyond the kind of computer uh, computer elect, uh, protocol elections, but rather uh, human elections, also need uh, you know a, a really good source of randomness. Uh, so I think that that blockchains can um, can the, the blockchain communities uh, can afford to develop this protocol and turn it into into a foundational. Uh, source of randomness for for the world, um, and so one of the one of the, the things though is that uh, you know if, if if you start kind of if you if you make a blockchain sort of depend on another protocol, uh, then you enter into a world where uh, you have one system that is supposed to be um, you know have very high availability and always run and so on suddenly depend on another uh, on another chain, and so if you think about uh, sort of how DRAN produces randomness uh, over time, you will hear a lot more about how that works later on. Uh, then you would have kind of a blockchain following that that protocol, uh, and a lot of people. Th this would give a lot of people pause in terms of, um, you know, making a blockchain dependent on another protocol. But a, uh, in a way, that's exactly where all of the sharding proposals uh, uh, are going. So blockchains, in general, as we as we scale them up to to get better transaction throughputs, are gonna end up in the in this world where there there's an architecture with with many different different chains, and there's there's a um, a a sort of uh, Potentially hierarchy or something like that that, um, that 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 achieves scalability. So in that sense, you can you can think of randomness as just one of the the, the root chains. Um, and and effectively, this is kind of where where um, Ethereum has has arrived uh, after considering many different uh, sharding proposals. Um, now now um, the current uh, uh, goal set and, and and the beacon chain that that is uh, I, I believe now live and which is really awesome uh, now uses this this beacon chain with uh, uh, that generates randomness securely, and this is an extremely uh, complex problem, as, as we heard from Vitalik and 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 we've seen in the in the uh, um, in the community. So so we'll, we'll uh, so this is a, I think a, a great example of how we can build blockchain systems that depend on uh, this kind of uh, source uh, source component uh, for randomness. Uh, so in Falcon, uh it kind of you know another way to to, to draw it is very similar to the Ethereum two uh, approach. Uh, and, and in Falcon uses DRAND in, in this way where um, there's effectively the, the DRAND protocol is producing uh, a chain of randomness uh, and then Falcon sort of uh, 
uh, pulls the randomness uh, into it. We'll hear a lot more about how exactly that works from Irene in a little bit. Um, just uh, so, so we hope that by us using DRAND, um, we will give a lot of momentum uh, and uh, to DRAND, and we hope that that will also inspire other folks to to come and and work together on this on this foundational um, uh, protocol. And then uh, with, whether it turns out to be DRAND or or maybe a VDF based thing in the future or something else uh, later on, uh, our goal and our hope would be that all all the work that we're doing for for building these these protocols can be can uh, turn out to um, to produce a a proper foundational uh, public utility in in the internet uh, that everyone can rely on uh, for randomness. Uh, so I'll give a short introduction to to what Falcon is, uh, and then I'll turn it over to Irene. Uh, Falcon is a decentralized storage uh, network designed to to store uh, humanity's most important information, and we want to build a very large scale network um, with uh, vast uh, storage resources that's decentralized and and organized by a protocol alone, uh, without having to to involve uh, sort of humans in the loop in 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 the, in the loop of making it make it making a deal. That's of course extremely difficult, uh, and you um, you can get close. Uh, and the you you can think of of the system as producing this this market where on one side um, uh, people are coming in to to provide um, a storage supply, and you can here you can see pictures of of Falcon miners uh, setting up their their uh, racks and machines and so on. Um, people come together to to provide the storage supply, and on the other side, you can have um, applications and clients and so on um, uh, being consuming the, that storage resource uh, and using it. And so, you, Falcon is a blockchain that um, that that organizes this this uh, this storage uh, marketplace. Um, and so, you can think of of, of a large constellation of, of parties that all come together to to make this thing work from uh, all of the the Hundreds of, of of miners and and uh, you know hundreds of or different organizations uh, working together to to produce this uh, the system and and then the you know uh, many other uh, organizations that build different parts and pieces of, of the of the protocol plus then all of the end users uh, that that are going to consume consume all that information uh, and and use that storage supply uh, all of these people all of these organizations and so on depend on a a, a good and uh, and secure uh, source of randomness. Uh, and so all of it is is um, uh, all of these folks uh, will will make use of of what you'll hear about in a moment. Uh, so I'll turn it over to you, Annie. Okay. So thank you for the introduction. I'll take from here and try to you know have some more details on about how Falcon works, and hopefully these details will help you to understand why randomness is so important, especially why we choose uh, to, to, to go with the random vehicle, with the as a random vehicle, a sort of random in Falcon. And as one said, so Filecoin, Filecoin is a blockchain where miners uh, actually need to provide storage to participate in this Filecoin chain. And they will earn from the consensus for participating from the consensus protocol that is standard chain, and they will earn some Filecoin tokens. More precisely, uh, storage, the storage that the, is provided by the, the, the miners is uh, divided in units that we call sectors. You can think like one sector is some spe this specific amount of space that the miner is committing to, to the network. Um, uh, and and these store these, these sectors containers for data, but you you cannot just put data in the raw form. We need to uh, encode the data with a specific protocol. We call it proof of replication. That basically from data creates a replica, and a replica is uh, has some very special properties that we are key for uh, Filecoin. For example, is a replica is not compressible, and a replica imports unique storage resources. And the replica is not easy at all uh, to re regenerate, to reconstruct. Once we have this uh, sector with replicas, each miner has own sectors. So basically, we ask miners to periodically prove that they're still storing the replicas because in Filecoin, we are interested not just at storage, but storage through time, okay? User for storage. And this is very easy. Uh, I'll mention this post proof of space time in the following. Remember that each replica, for each replica, the miners store the replica and put on the chain just the root of a Merkle tree constructed on the replica. When we ask to the miner to prove that he's still storing consistently, per persistently over time this replica, he just have to uh, open path for random location 
in the replica open the path respect to the route that everyone knows. And this because of how the replica is, uh, is this a special encoding with special property, uh, basically guarantees that the miner is storing now and it has stored through time since the last time we asked him to prove, basically. Okay, uh, this is the situation and uh, these are the building blocks. And clearly with these building blocks, we can construct Filecoin if we have good randomness because we use randomness a bit everywhere. We use randomness in leader election and consensus. We use randomness to check that the replicas are constructed uh, in a correct way. We check, we use randomness for, for this post proof of space time. Um, I don't have time to explain uh, everything. So I focus on the consensus part. How do we use it for leader election? And leader election in general, this uh, means that we have a set of participants, they all have different power, different weight, and we must find a way to uh, select a few of them in a way that is verifiable, they can prove that they are the ones that have been selected. They are selected, the, the, the more power you have, the, the more likely you are going to be selected, the fairness properties. And we want to be a secret, so I am the only one that I know I'm being selected before I reveal it. And in particular, we also want for scalability reasons, some efficient protocol, like hopefully with no communication between the participants. Uh, in fact, the leader election has two steps. So first one is kind of a standard step, like a VRF based election. I will explain it a bit more in a second. And then we have a, a winning post. So we do one of these uh, proof of uh, storage through time for the leaders that have been uh, uh, newly elected. Uh, VRF-based election is, uh, uh, I would say, a standard, a standard tool for blockchain and means that you have uh, like this uh, verifiable function that is just basically a pseudo-random generator that will also take a key, an input, a key, it takes a seed as all uh, the pseudo-random generator, a good seed, it also takes a key and uh, the output is the pseudo-random number and also uh, a proof that that a uh, particular number, I call it S in the slide, is correctly computed given that key. And everyone can check this. So when you use a VRF, a leader election is quite simple. Construct an efficient uh, leader election is quite simple because you associate miners with keys and then you just, uh, every miner runs locally uh, the, the key on the seed and check if wins check this random output against the target that it has to be proportional to his uh, own power. That is a public uh, information, everyone can check it. Uh, and this way you get the fairness property, okay? Because the larger the, larger the target, the, the more likely that you win. And also from the property of the VRF, you get all the other properties that you need from this leader election. Be careful that we do need a good C, a good fresh public random seed for each leader election, okay? But given that we are done, the second step, the, 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 this is very particular, this is very uh, specific to Filecoin, is that we are not happy to just let leader with the VRF, we want to leader to prove that they still have their replicas, okay? And what we do is, uh, for example, we ask to, uh, sam we, we, we sample the chain, some of our samples at random, uh, one of the sector they claim to they are still storing and they do a post for uh, that specific set. So we call this the winning post, the, the post for uh, the miners that are winning the leader election. Um, and here again, uh, it's very important when we sample, we do use some source of randomness, so a seed. So as you see, I mean, as you see, everything works out quite well, assuming that you have this magic box that is my slide is a green box. The, uh, that produce these seeds so that has to be unbiasable. Otherwise, people can win more, can break the fairness property. It has to be public for variability and distributed also because in reality, one motivated this very well. Uh, and also, something that is very important in Filecoin is unpredictability of these seeds. Otherwise, if you don't have unpredictability, the post becomes somehow ineffective. Let me explain this why. Um, assume that you are a miner, you are storing your, uh, 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 the, you are a miner, you are participating in Filecoin, and you are on average elected, I don't know, once or twice a day, not very often. And assume also that the seeds comes a bit in advance. 
I don't know, one hour, two hours in advance. So the, the seeds that they're using now, for not if you are elected with them now, you know it two hours before. If this is the case, what you can do, you could delete your replicas for like all the times that you know you're not going to be elected either and just redo the replication algorithm just before the, or in time before the election. So unpredictability, keep this in mind, is, uh, is essential to guarantee uh, persistent storage, to guarantee that when we check persistent storage, this check is effective. Um, so now we want to understand how we spend time to understand how we can get these seeds. And like, I guess the first normal place to look is the blockchain itself. You have a blockchain, people are using this for producing random, and so that's exactly what we did. We try to use the blockchain itself to see if we can extract this small seed and, and, and uh, use it for, for, for the goals I show you. Um, there are protocols that, that do this, but usually this protocol, they kind of extract the seed using information that is uh, created and, and, and stored in blocks that are in the past of my blockchain. Uh, if you're familiar, so like Ouroboros Browse, uh, Spacing, they do something like this. So you take very quick example, you take some uh, headers from back in the past in the chain when the chain is stable and, and, and you ask together, you use this as a seed. This works, it gives you randomly that is not easy to bias, uh, depends clearly on the protocol. But the problem is that it is predictable. It's very predictable because you have to take something that is from the past. So it means that it's something that you are going to know in advance, okay? Um, so it doesn't work for Filecoin, this solution. Um, so the natural next try, the next attempt is, okay, do the same extraction or something similar with information that are in recent blocks, like blocks that are not back in the past, like, like much before finality, like few, few epochs before now. And the problem with that, as uh, uh, Brian also mentioned in the, um, the first talk, is that then becomes very, very easy to bias. Because basically the chain is not stable now, I can just maybe one miner can just not uh, append, append his own block, produce his own block, and do a lot of these uh, in, let's call it short local attack and bias to the next seed, okay? So we kind of lose the, the biasability property that it's also uh, uh, indispensable. So basically, what I'm, if you try to use to extract from chain, we have this standoff, we, have seen, we saw this standoff where you, if, you, if you try to take something that isn't predictable, then you give up biasability and the other way around. So the solution, the smart solution that we, we came up is to use a random beacon. So give up with the extracting from, from chain and use these external good sources of randomness that is, has all the property uh, that we require. And this solves our problem. And clearly, I mean, I don't have to repeat this because one uh, motivated is uh, random, the random was the, the, the good choice for us for, for all the reasons that we mentioned.